Good morning. Thank you for taking the time uh, of your busy schedule and uh, attending this presentation. My name is Supreet Shishadri. I'm the general manager for Amazon AppStream. Uh, today, uh, we'll be talking about uh, how we can use Amazon AppStream as a platform to build software as a service based uh, delivery model for delivering uh, a wide variety, wide variety of application workloads. Uh, we have a, a customer uh, who has been with us all along, Aviva, uh, the head of their cloud computing group. He's going to share their story and journey of how they've built the platform with us. And then we'll also talk about what are some of the opportunities that we can work together uh, along the way. So in 2013, uh, we built uh, Amazon AppStream as an SDK-based platform. Uh, the goal of this platform was to allow our customers to integrate uh, streaming technology right into their products. Uh, along the way, a lot of customers used it, and they also gave us really good feedback, uh, saying that uh, building this uh, SDK-based approach is uh, more time-consuming than what it was expected. Uh, they also said uh, there were some feature gaps that really prevented it to make it uh, work in a production class ecosystem. Uh, they also said uh, the cost of the, perf the instance, at that time uh, we were offering only one instance type, G2.2XL at 84 cents an hour. Uh, they said it was very expensive and was not cost effective. Uh, we at Amazon, we really uh, like to hear what our customers say, and we're okay in making mistakes. Uh, we like failures, uh, so we took this feedback and we went back to the drawing board uh, and formed a new team uh, and decided to take all the feedback from the customers and we decided to build a brand new service. Uh, today we are gonna announce uh, Amazon AppStream 2.0. Uh, it's a fully managed application streaming service uh, that delivers your desktop applications to a browser. Uh, there is no clients. It's a, it's, a, it's a protocol that is fully compliant with HTML5 browser, so all you can interact with your application is, uh, is through the browser. Uh, some of the key features, uh, we'll dive deep into it, we'll talk about the benefits, uh, but some of the key features is uh, our, our client approach is you've got to run your applications in the browser. Uh, there is no need for a thick client, there is no need for native clients. Uh, you should be able to use your all applications, whether it's a productivity application, whether it's a graphics workload application, you should be able to run it in a browser. Uh, we want your apps and data to be secure. Uh, we want the apps and data to be in the AWS uh, so it doesn't leave anywhere. Uh, we, we want just to send pixels back to your uh, browsers so that you can run your application securely in a browser. Uh, we want you to be able to use this anywhere, everywhere, so that you don't have to worry about building data centers, worrying about how do I set up the infrastructure, whether it's for your enterprise workload or whether it's for your uh, globally accessible um, workforce. So why did we build AppStream 2.0? Uh, we heard from a lot of our customers it's very critical for them to move their end-user computing applications to run in the cloud to get the same benefits that they have been getting from their server workloads. They wanted to provide instant access to their employees uh, for enterprises from anywhere on any device. And for ISVs and lots of uh, customers in the high performance computing space, they also wanted to be able to co-locate their applications and data all together. They didn't want to move data back and forth between their on-prem uh, data centers or from their on-prem offices back to the other data centers, whether it was their data centers or our data centers. And then they wanted to have the ability where the application streaming just becomes a simple tool. It's no longer this complex heavy lifting infrastructure that's required to deliver applications to their users. And fundamentally, what, whether you choose a business enterprise, whether you choose an ISV, you choose a large high performance computing uh, customer, at the end of the day, they want to make sure is they deliver their apps to their end users and make it available on any device. So those were kind of the the founding uh, uh, problems or the tenants that we wanted to address. And uh, when you look up across the use cases, whether you take a business enterprise that wants to deliver uh, a business specific application to an user, or they want to deliver Windows applications to a set of heterogeneous devices that they typically have, uh, they, they came back to us and said, hey, could we deliver this in a streaming ecosystem? Uh, ISVs, a uh, lot of the ISVs wants to deliver applications to users. They want to pursue trials. They want to pursue demos. They want, a lot of universities wants to do online workshops. And they also want to deliver software as a, as a service so that you can rent the software by the hour rather than 
trying to buy the software and pay uh, the upfront cost. Uh, the, the companies in the design and engineering space specifically uh, wanted to solve this problem of where they wanted to co-locate the data and application so you can visualize uh, the applications very effectively and not move the data back and forth. So we wanted to build a platform that kind of addresses all these uh, use cases, but do it in a way that overcomes all the gaps and limitations that we learned from AppStream 1. So what I'm going to walk you through the next set of slides is what are some of the key things that we changed uh, that will address some of these uh, uh, core concerns from our customers and what are the benefits that you actually see. The first thing is we took the approach of uh, HTML5 clients only. So our goal was to deliver applications to users such that they don't have to install anything. That is, they're not waiting for large file downloads. There is no need for them to use plugins, uh, but be able to access any application just from the browser. Uh, so our fundamental philosophy was whatever we do, whether it's an administrative task or it's an end user task, do it all from the browser. The second one was we wanted the uh, applications that you have, whether it's an application that you're writing today or an application that you have written 10 years ago, we wanted you to use your applications without making any changes. Uh, this was one of the uh, a significant a difference in approach that we took is in the past, we provided you SDK. So we wanted you to deeply integrate that SDK into your platform, but based on the customer feedback, we kind of uh, took the different approach here is your, your binaries will not have to be modified. You just take your application, as long as it installs and runs on Windows operating system, you can just use your applications here. The other big ask was we don't want to change our IT infrastructure. We want these streaming instances to be able to access our corporate resources, all in the VPC or in our on-prem data centers. We don't want to make any changes to our corporate firewalls. Uh, we don't want to make any changes to ports. So th there was a big ask from enterprises is, can you build a streaming platform that works like web-based? Uh, so we uh, took this and made sure that whatever we build works with your existing infrastructure. So with this uh, AppStream 2.0, you are able to access all your resources, whether it's in your VPC, uh, whether it's in your on-prem data centers, or, or over the internet. And then these instances will work uh, just without opening any firewall ports. And then the other big thing is we wanted to make it a fully managed service like others, other, some of our other AWS services. We didn't want our customers to do the heavy lifting of deploying, managing, scaling, and uh, enforcing uh, all these management logistics all by themselves. And we wanted to do all the heavy lifting. So this service is completely managed, uh, very similar to uh, one of our uh, pro other products in the same family, Amazon Workspaces, where it's a fully managed service where we take care of the deployment, management, and scaling across all our regions. And then the, while we did this, what we wanted to make sure is you always had a consistent performance experience, uh, whether the end user is using the application locally, they're using uh, via streaming. We just wanted them to uh, make sure that the experience is consistent so there is no sluggishness or there is the responsiveness of the app is very crisp. The way we did the sluggish, the way we try to provide the responsiveness of the applications is typically when you see uh, some of the existing solutions is uh, just to provide you the, the right cost benefits, they take an instance or they take a server and they place a lot of users and they do resource slicing uh, and that gives you a better cost economics, but it doesn't really give you the right performance. What we do is we give a dedicated VM instance for each user during the course of the streaming session uh, such that the user and the application experience is not compromised. So that's one of the, the fundamental ways in which we actually solve uh, the user experience behavior. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the few uh, slides is I'm going to use this uh, streaming example. Uh, I think this could apply to ISVs. That could apply to uh, the customers in the public sector space. This could apply to customers in the education sector uh, where, let's say, you want to launch a, an online learning system where you want to uh, st have thousands of students that gets enrolled, but you don't want to deploy or manage any infrastructure. 30 minutes before the class starts, you want to be able to kind of uh, give them uh, the streaming URLs, and then the class starts. At the end of the class, you just want the infrastructure to get torn down. So you just pay for that one hour 
when that infrastructure is running for this thousand instance. So that's kind of the setup that we are going to be using as an example. Uh, what we are going to talk about it is, in the next few slides, is what are the building blocks that are required uh, for this, and then how does AppStream 2 addresses the building blocks and provides you the, the, the right components. So when you dissect that problem, there is basically three, uh, three entities. One, end users who really need to use the applications from their own device without uh, uh, compromising on the end user experience. The second one, we need a streaming technology that can provide this experience where the end users can access these applications in a seamless fashion. The third one is we need an administrator or a provider who's able to do this setup so quickly that it's not a complex process. So let's work backwards from the end user and see how AppStream 2 kind of helps solve these problems. The first one is the simple user experience. So what, as, as I said, we took the HTML5 approach, but we also wanted to make sure that it's not just a single app experience. Uh, you, we wanted people to interact with the applications just like how you interact on your desktops. Very, when you start your computer, you may start with Outlook, then you may start to use some other uh, instant messenger application. You may switch to using some Eclipse or Visual Studio, some other productivity tools. So we wanted you to have the ability to uh, interact with multiple apps. Uh, obviously, with applications comes data. So we wanted you to have the ability to copy-paste data across your applications, uh, copy between local and remote, and then move files back and forth between your local machine and the remote machine. So we, we wanted to include that. Uh, obviously, there are uh, an online learning university comes with certain set of tutorials. So you wanted the ability where you can play playback videos. And then we wanted to provide you persistent op storage options whereby if you want just a transient storage, you have it. If you want a built-in storage, you can have it or you can bring your own st storage. So what we ended up with is a browser experience somewhat similar to this, uh, which we will show towards the end, is this is a HTML5 browser Chrome that's running with a bunch of applications uh, that are running. Uh, what you see is a Tyler view, where you see all the applications that are in tile set. So these are the applications that are running on that instance that's showing this. Uh, here is an example of this instance where it's running graphics workloads, productivity workloads, and then you're able to switch between that. Uh, and then we also wanted to make sure that if, a, if uh, an end user wants to just focus on a single application, they're able to bring this uh, immersive app experience similar to some of the tablet uh, experiences. So you can always bring an application back to the foreground and just go full screen. So your whole desktop, all you're doing is interacting with this application. Uh, and then you can always go back to that, uh, the tile mode of app switching where you can interact with different applications. The second component was the protocol. Uh, back in 2013, we had a protocol called STX. Uh, that was a protocol that we built. Uh, it was working really well, but it had some challenges in traversing the network. Uh, and then that was one of the, the, the core feedback that we got from the customers is, can you, can you solve this problem for us where we don't need to make any network changes? Uh, along this journey, uh, we also found feedback from lots of customers in the 3D workloads, uh, advanced engineering and life sciences sector. Uh, the, there was a company called Nice uh, that's based in Italy uh, that they were using this protocol for all their workloads. And it was really well received. People love this experience. And uh, they asked, why can't we use this in AWS? Uh, so we heard this feedback and we did our own rounds of tests and we really thought the experience was really good. So we went and made them part of the Amazon family. and. Uh, now we're using this protocol. So we are using nice DCV. Uh, this is a new protocol that's being used. Uh, the advantage of this is this protocol works seamlessly in a browser. Uh, we have a, it's fronted by a gateway. So none of your streaming instances are actually exposed to the world. Uh, all your streaming instances are completely secure in your VPC uh, so that those instances which have access to your data are all secure. And it's fronted by a gateway that's, that's protecting all your instances. So, the whole traffic from the browser till the instance is completely encrypted, and it's all going over HTTPS. So, so it's, it's, uh, security was, is, was a big uh, emphasis for us, and that's uh, the second piece of the puzzle uh, that goes here. The third one was uh, some customers really like the SDK approach, but they wanted flexibility. So they said, I want to do everything that I'm doing if I choose to do using a management console. Uh, this may be for quick trials, or I may be uh, having people uh, that may not want to use APIs. So they wanted all the flexibility in the console. 
Uh, similarly, we wanted anything that we build in AWS, we want to make sure that developers can use this platform and actually build different set, set of products and solutions. So we wanted to take the approach of, we'll also provide you APIs as how you can actually do this administration. So the next set of uh, slides just briefly talks about what an administrator has to do. Uh, because we talked about an end user gets a new URL, uh, and they just load up a browser and start using the apps. We talked about the second building block, which is the streaming protocol, uh, which the end user doesn't have to do, just provides the experience. The third part uh, is the administrator. What does he needs to do? So let's say you're in university, you want to provide the students a set of applications. The very first step uh, the end user, uh, the administrator has to do is to build an image. This is nothing, this is very similar to the EC2 armies, whereby you launch an EC2 instance, uh, you install your applications, you prepare an image. But what we did is we are giving you a new tool called Image Builder, which is also a web-based experience uh, that you can access it through the AWS Management Console. You go launch an Image Builder, you see your full Windows desktop in the browser, in admin mode, you can do your installation just like how you would do it on a physical desktop. At the end of the application run, you just uh, say prepare an image, the image gets prepared, and then that's your baseline. So the next set of uh, slides be briefly talk about what are the four steps and what you ne actually need to do. It. Step one is the image, uh, you build an image. The, as I said, you launch an image builder, you install your apps, whether it's a native app or it's a virtualized app, as long as it runs on Windows Server 2012, uh, we, it will work there. You can optimize it, uh, your app, for whatever the way you want to configure it. And one of the key things that uh, what you want to see is when you launch an app in a browser, you want that instant on experience. Uh, so that we have, uh, we actually, after your applications are installed, we do a, a type of pre-warming so that your applications, whether it's a graphics application, whether it's a productivity application, the customers don't have to wait for the applications to load. Uh, so we do some optimizations there. And then at the end of the day, we prepare an image that shows up in your image registry. Now that you have an image in your image registry, uh, uh, you basically are getting ready to uh, set up your fleet. The, as, the next step on the, uh, is to set up a fleet. A fleet is a composition of, you take an image, you apply scaling policies. Uh, we will provide you multiple types of scaling policies. Uh, you can set up a fixed fleet. Uh, you can set up policies using your CloudWatch metrics and alarms that you can control your costs on how you want the applications to scale, uh, scale up and scale down. This is dictated by how your users will come and use your applications. If you're seeing a huge burst of uh, users coming in, set up a scaling policy based on the arrival rate, and we will basically scale it accordingly. Uh, and then similarly, you can set it to tear down uh, as you want. If I go back to the online university example, if you know there are 1,000 students that are coming in, you choose a desired capacity of 1,000 uh, before the class starts. 1,000 instances come up, and you set the uh, duration of the class for, let's say, if it's one hour, you set the duration to be one hour, 15 minutes, uh, so that the students have access for the full uh, course of the, the class. And at the end of the one hour, 15 minutes, all the instances will get automatically torn down. And the most important thing is each of these instances you can provision in your VPC and choose the subnet of your choice. And that way, if these applications need access to your database servers, your file servers, your VPC, other resources that are on your VPC, it's completely accessible. Each of these instances, you can control whether they want internet access or not and define your internet settings so you control your network policies and, and apply your corporate policies as, as needed. But along each one of the slides, as you see in the bottom, there is actually an API command that's being listed. So whatever the action that you can do uh, through the management console, you can do each one of those actions through the APIs. The last step is the stack. So you took an image builder, you created an image, you took the image, you defined your fleet. Now you know how much capacity you have, but you now have to define how do, how do I make this fleet discoverable to the world? So this, that's where the concept of stack comes in. A stack is basically a composition of your, uh, an endpoint associated where the users can go and access it. It's uh, a composition of your access policies, how you want to control access to these applications. And then you basically can say, uh, control other user access policies around it. So that, that gives you a stack which as a publicly discoverable endpoint, but it's access control. 
So when you set this up, uh, people may be wondering, well, how does my infrastructure look like? So what you have here uh, is two uh, examples. Let's say you are a customer who is on the public internet and you want to be able to provide access to the streaming instances. It goes through the streaming gateway. Uh, this is an Amazon infrastructure. Uh, and your fleets all have access to your VPC. Uh, in this example, as you can see, we have database servers. We have a HPC cluster running in your VPC. So each one of the streaming instances have access to that. And let's say you, you choose to say, I don't want the access to come from the public gate internet and only want to come from your on-prem. You can set up routing policy such that the traffic only flows from your on-prem network through your direct connect onto the streaming gateway and access the streaming infrastructure. Uh, the instances in the green are the streaming instances, and they all have internet, a, a, a network interface in your VPC. Uh, so your instances are never exposed to the world, but they're always accessed through a secure streaming gateway. The last step is, OK, we set up the stack. The stack has an endpoint. What do, you, what do you do next? The next step is you use this API called Create Streaming URL. You give the address of the stack. You tell how many URLs you want to generate. And you want to set, uh, you basically define how long you want these URLs to be available for. Uh, the way we have modeled the streaming URLs are very similar to our other uh, AWS resources. Let's say you have a bucket and you want S3 bucket and you want to make it accessible to others. You define a, a S3 signed URL. You set what, how long you want the, you, the accessible window to be. And you define the lease and it, makes, it becomes available. Same concept here. You, when you create a new URL, you just tell how long you want this resource to be valid for and how many days uh, the user can use it. And then you can also define whether it's a single connect or multiple connect. Uh, so, you do, so that way, if a student is, has to use the class multiple times in a day and you want them to be uh, accessing this URL, so you can set those uh, policies. So once you uh, define uh, this URL, you generate the URL, and that's what you actually give it back to uh, the, to your um, students. So in this example. But uh, so that's kind of talking about the three building blocks, right? Uh, the first we talked about the end user. Second, we talked about the, the protocol. The third, we talked about the admin experiences, how they set up the stack. The, the other interesting challenge that we had was we provided only single instance type, which was really effective for high fidelity graphics applications but it was not cost effective for other, other workloads that customers would use. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, what, what can we do here and what can we do better? Uh, so in the new AppStream 2.0 platform, you will have access to 16 instance types, or sorry, 16 instance types. Uh, and they're, bro they're broken into four categories. Uh, one is the general purpose compute. Uh, if you want to run just the productivity workload and you do not, you, you really don't need too much CPU or memory, that's a good uh, use case there. Let's say you want to run an analytics workload, so we're going to offer you compute-based instance types uh, that will allow you to use a lot of CPU cycles. Let's say you want to run a rich graphical application that requires a lot of memory, you can use uh, memory-optimized applications. And then we heard it loud and clear that we want a graphical instances that's cost-effective, so we'll be offering uh, a new type of graphical instances that will allow you to run really uh, graphic workloads in a very cost-effective way. Uh, yesterday, uh, in the keynote, uh, you also might have heard that we announced Elastic GPU. Uh, so we are going to be supporting Elastic GPU at launch, uh, whereby you can pick any of the compute instance type and attach GPUs. So let's say you are working on uh, you're working on a photo editing software, and you are not a, a photo uh, designer. Let's say you want to use uh, edit some software, uh, edit some photos. You want to apply some filters, but you want to just do it on a burst basis. Uh, so you can pick an instance type, attach GPU units, uh, depending on for how long you want to use it, edit your software, crop it, uh, save it, and then just uh, you can detach the GPUs and detach the instances. Uh, so you can uh, use it as a flexible vehicle depending on your workload pattern. And uh, so, so we'll, we'll probably be providing all these instance types so you, so you can pick and choose what instance type fits your workload profile and what performance you want this for. And then the last thing is, uh, we also wanted to make sure that the, the, uh, the instances are cost effective. Uh, so we wanted to make sure uh, that, that your workload, you, you're not holding back your workloads uh, just because it's expensive. So we wanted to give you a spectrum of choices and 
as I said, we have four different uh, category types. So we will be starting. Uh, you can start streaming for an hour at 10 cents uh, using the general purpose compute. Uh, the full list of pricing is on the new AppStream 2 portal. Uh, but you can pick the size of your choice uh, in each of those categories and then uh, pick a workload that fits your profile. And you pay by the hour. Uh, so, so you just pay for what the, the user duration the, uh, the, of the streaming is. And it's an all-inclusive pricing, so there is nothing uh, additive there. And then if you bring your own CALS, we bear off your whole CALS fee. This is a fee that is required to access a Windows graphical uh, system. Uh, so if you bring that, uh, your own licenses, we just waive that fee for you. So in that case, it's completely just the streaming by the hour. So I kind of walked you through the journey today where we launched this service back in 2013. We made mistakes. We, made, we had failures. Uh, we went back to the drawing board based on the customer feedback, and we rebuilt a platform. So that's kind of, and I kind of talked about how the new platform works, where it's all browser-based, uh, API-driven first, so you can use it either as a turnkey solution or either you can use it as an API-based platform that you can actually use it along the way. Uh, and then uh, we kind of talked about an example where how an online university course could be set up in a matter of minutes, and then you can use it and then tear it down. Right? Uh, but I wanted you guys also hear the story from a customer of ours who's been all along with us and supportive of this journey. So I would like to invite uh, the head of cloud computing from Aviva to share their journey and walk them through how they actually are using AppStream 2.0. Thank Hello, everyone. Um, I am, of course, super excited to be here. That's very strange for a Swede to say, because when something is super exciting, we say it's good, which is good. But I am super excited. Anyway, um, so I work for Aviva. Uh, we are um, a leading supplier of engineering design and information management software solutions. So um, we're actually trying to uh, power the digital asset. The digital asset is what we call sort of the digital twin. It's the um, digital version of an asset that you might see could be a power plant, it could be a tension leg platform, it could be a ship. And uh, we work in um, several different verticals, and um, like oil and gas, marine, pulp and paper, and so on. Um, so we, we, we are quite significant in this area, and, and what we do is we support these customers with um, engineering and design applications that are quite significant in terms of um, the graphical demands on it. So we've got actually the top 10 uh, energy companies in the world using our software to design their power plants. Um, and we've got about nine out of 10 of the global shipyards, the, the, the biggest ones. And I'm not gonna tell you which one we don't have yet. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use this word more and more or over, or over the whole presentation, the digital asset. And so this is just to make it very clear that for us, the application sort of comes second. So at the heart and the first and the most, thing, most important thing for us is, is the project data. It's, it's what, you, uh, uh, what you create, what you consume. So around this we obviously have a whole raft of different applications. Some of them are 1D, some of them are 2D, and some of them are 3D, some of them are highly graphical, and some of them are more like um, uh, Excel-type applications, if you like. Uh, but what we did was that we decided to go for the, go for the mo most difficult one. May not be a smartest choice to do, but I think in our case it was pretty smart because it meant that we started on this journey quite some time ago. So this is Aviva Everything 3D. It's a multidiscipline um, design uh, application which manages uh, design of piping, structural cabling, uh, HVAC, and anything that you might want to, to design uh, when you create like uh, an oil rig or, or um, uh, the outfitting of a ship or something like that. So we started the journey in 2004, 14, sorry. Um, and it, it was really because we said, we've got this huge problem that we, we're, a, we're a company who's been working with this market for 35 years. 
And um, we've always been very graphics, uh, graphics intense. Um, and we obviously started thinking about the cloud, saying, how, how can we move there? We can obviously move there fairly easily with our information management solutions, but the, the graphics ones are definitely a problem. So anyway, we got in contact with, uh, with Amazon, and we saw this blog, uh, Jeff Barr. Well, we actually got talked to, to Amazon before that, but I, I just picked that because this really told us what we could potentially do. do. So what we did was that we, we did exactly what we had to do in, in those days with AppStream as it was. So we built an enablement service based on, on using Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, we built this Windows client using the provided SDK, and we created this AppStream image with, where we did some silent installs, and, and to start with, we actually put some static project data on it. And yes, the streaming experience was absolutely fabulous. It was great, and we were astonished because we, we didn't actually think it was possible to get such a good um, 3D experience uh, when running this on-premises in um, a data center that maybe was in North Virginia whilst we were in, in Europe. Um, so to take this a bit further, we decided to do a proof of concept with three of our major corporate customers. And this time, we, we needed to do this with their own data. So we couldn't actually put their own static data onto the instances, because obviously this, this is, a, this is a, an environment where you can be you know, like 10, 50, or 500 people working on the same project. So we needed to sort of solve that problem, at least in this, this POC. If we didn't do it, then it, it, it would be sort of a cool thing to look at, but not something that could be used in, in real life. Um, so they said to us when they looked at it, you know what, the streaming experience looks absolutely great, but there was in, in the documentation, in the upstream documentation, we found this line. Well, we knew about it, but we, we, we weren't actually a bit naive, probably, but we didn't fully realize how important this was. Uh, because what happened was that when we started up the, the, the POCs with these three customers, we, we basically spent days with their IT departments. Because they soon, they looked at the, the traffic and they said, come on guys, this is unencrypted traffic, you, you, you're kidding us. Um, and they said, well, we've looked at the port 80 traffic, that's, that's not even real web traffic. And all of these UDP ports and no proxy support and, and, and. And so they basically said, no, nope, no way, can't do it. So we had some concerns of our own. So we had this enablement service, and we needed to put that customer data somewhere. And obviously, we needed to secure it, and we needed to do it in a way that we could do this um, in isolation per customer, of course. And then the, the upstream instances, as they were fired up, they were running in a VPC that we couldn't control. And not only couldn't we control that, but we couldn't even, we didn't know what IP addresses they had. And so basically, we just could not secure uh, the access to the project data. Um, Supreet mentioned also the cost, and definitely that, that was also a potential problem. But the most, made, or the major concern was really the fact that we couldn't secure the access from the upstream instance to the customer data. Now, you might think that we're a bit crazy, because independent of all of those problems, we went ahead and we, we made sort of one of the things that, that, that Sapreet was talking about just before. So we created a self-training site. Now we knew from the very start that, that this would not fly seamlessly within corporate uh, environments. Although we've seen that in most cases, if they have a guest network, it actually works from there because they are more open. So this, this was launched at, as more like a, um, a personal training site for people where it's free to sign on, uh, it's full with training material, and we started off by, by having training material, moving people from an earlier version of our software into the newest version. And we also provided them with a fixed number of hours of running our application on, on AppStream. 
And I'm not sure about the numbers right now, but I think it's, it's a couple of thousands of people who have been uh, using it. Which, in our case, you know, we are quite, quite niched. To us, that's a lot of people. But we really wanted to do this, you know, as a production business case. Um, so that's also the reason that we sort of stayed on, because we, uh, we were in close contact with AWS. Um, we spoke to Supreme. Um, we told him about a number of things that we really wanted. Um, and what we wanted to do was to support um, what we call a subcontractor scenario. So this is, this is really our first toe dip in the water, if you like. So the, um, the scenario is the following. So we've got this major um, contractor, and he's about to create some, some, uh, a, a capital project. So let's say it's a tension leg platform uh, to be in the Mexican Gulf. And uh, he's working with a lot of sub subcontractors, and they do that today. Of, co of course, they've got networks of subcontractors. But what we wanted to do was to make it possible for these subcontractors to connect into the project that the main contractor has, but do that to the cloud. And we have uh, today already some software, which we call Aviva Global, which is, uh, let's say, a synchronization software where we can actually take parts of a project and we can move that to another place in the world and you can start synchronizing between the two. Um, so we decided to, to use that, to leverage on that, change it quite a bit actually, but, but have sort of the same mindset because our customers are very used to, to, to using um, Aviva Global. But instead then creating this project satellite into the cloud together with configurations and settings and so on. Um, and then make it possible for the main contractor inside our platform, Aviva Connect, to make it possible to invite subcontractor sub users into that platform and then for them being able to start do some, some real, real work, real design work on this project. And we say then now that the first subcontractor user access should be within hours. Now, that may not seem fantastic. Basically, you should say, well, why not within minutes? Well, first of all, the, the, the time that is needed there is really for the, the, the ACME uh, project administrator to decide exactly what he wants to, to, um, to put in the cloud. And then there's a little bit of upload time. But if we had gone lower, below within hours, and said within minutes, they would probably not believe us. Because today this process is normally on-premises, fully on-premises, can be something, something between three weeks and three months for them to do that. And this is all about you know, all of the IT requirements, the rubber stamping, the setting up of the VPNs, and, and uh, IT department talking to each other and saying, I'm not going to let you into my corporate network, and, and vice versa. So doing this within hours and without any IT um, involved is really what we targeted. So in order to be able to do that, we obviously had a number of requirements that we, we, we spoke to, to AWS about. So on the client side, we said, please, 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 no IT overhead. Because the, we, we talk to engineers. We don't talk to the IT departments. Well, we do if we have to. But the, you know, the engineers, they just want to make ships or oil, oil rigs or, or things like that, not to engage with the IT department, if they can avoid it. And in order to, to, um, to fully satisfy the IT department, so they realized we don't have to get involved here, is of course that, that uh, the whole traffic is secured, um, that it goes to known gateways, and that there is no client install. But we did not want to give up on the high quality streaming. So it still needs to be highly dynamic. Uh, smaller things like the cursor feedback, so if the cursor is changing on the remote thing, it should be changing on the local thing and so on. Clipboard, obviously, um, and restorable state. So if I've been into my application and I've, set, I've moved all my windows in different places and done all my settings, when I come back, I don't want that to be all forgotten. I have to start over again. And then if we look at the, the, the server and the management side, sort of our, sorry, our side is number one, we have to have secure access to the data. 
So we need it to be launched inside of EPC of our choosing. Um, and also to be able to launch it inside a private subnet of that. And then we, we although it's, it's cool to work with a, with a console, this is what you do when you get started, when you play around a bit. But in the end, we need programmatic access to that because we need to automate all of those things. Um, yeah. So what we've done is that we, we've built our own portal. Um, a very simple schematic picture of this. Um, we call it Aviva Connect. Um, and this is not only a portal, it's also a platform. It's a platform where we are delivering um, our services. And uh, I'm starting with the other ones. And you can imagine that the next one is going to come, which is the one that is, is delivering through upstream. This is a platform that is built on the serverless architecture. And uh, the other thing to deliver here, I have deliberately not called it neither AppStream nor Aviva E3D. I'm calling it a solution environment. And I'll show you just in a second what I, why I do that. So as I said in the beginning, the application sort of comes second for us. So it's the project, the digital asset that comes as, as number one. So a solution environment for us is, number one, what is, what is the, the data source? So what is the project? Number two is, how is that configured? Because accessing a project, you can do through many different configurations, depending on whether you're a piper, you're a structural engineer, electrical engineer. And so all of these configurations come into play depending on what, what skill set and what function you have. We actually support some customization. And again, that customization is also depending on, again, uh, what function you have. Basically, what's your reason for being into to, uh, my project, into the digital asset. And finally, the application. So although I was saying in the beginning that we're doing this now with Aviva, everything 3D, our major sh um, ship, uh, flagship, we're building this platform to, to be sort of not, not application agnostic, but surely be able to support many different applications. And, and also to be able to do that. I didn't say that in the beginning, but the portal, the whole point with the portal is obviously that it's self-service for our customers. And so any configuration, any, any deployment, anything that they need to do is just-in-time deployment and based on the actions of, of the uh, customer's administrator. So with this solution environment, so now we've got the user. So the user, he, he logs into Aviva Connect, and he gets in his face a dashboard. And that dashboard is dependent on the permissions that he's got. And, and again, it's not, it's not the permission to an application. For us, it's to, the permission to a project with a particular um, application with a particular setup and configuration and customization. Um, and this changes rapidly and all the time in, in a highly agile, if you like, environment like an engineering project where you onboard and offload um, uh, subcontractors uh, very often. So anyway, de depending on what you have in your face, you click on one of those. Um, there is a launch command, basically, this launch command picks up all of these parameters and all of those pieces and passes them across to, to, to AppStream, if you like, and where they are consumed and make sure that, that we have the right credentials and we can access the right data source. And in the end, we get back the streaming URL that is passed into the um, browser of the end user. So I, I just want to make this... To us, this is a very, very important statement as well. We need these session startup parameters because we're not there just to give someone an application. We're giving them access to a digital asset, to a major capital project in design under a number of different circumstances. Um, and we need to specify those. So for, for the end user, this, this is not really just starting A3D. For him, it is, I am now going to do some significant piping in this area of this, um, this project. Um, we're also keeping the, all our customers that we onboard, we keep their data 
uh, secured in, in customer-specific VPCs. So any customer having an account with us gets his own VPC. And in that VPC, <coughs> we also, in the public side, we have this link that we talked about, the Aviva Global, where we synchronize parts of a project from on-premises up to the cloud. And then in the private subnet, we keep the data. And this is also where we then launch the AppStream instance. Um, yes. So now I'll see if I can do just a little quick demo. Um, as you will see soon, I am not an engineer of that sort, neither a Strucky nor a, nor a, a Piper. I'm, a, I'm really a software person. Um, so this is, this is the, the Aviva Connect portal, so the outside of it, how it looks for, for, a, um, for, a, for a customer. I'll be logging in now as an end user, which means that in my face I will get a dashboard showing me what I'm allowed to do. Now, those of you who um, are looking closely, you'll see that I'm running in a dev environment. So this is obviously something that we are currently building. Uh, And as you know, AppStream 2.0 is, is really, really new. We have had the pleasure of working together with Supreet and his team. So we've, we've been you know, trying out some betas, uh, looking at the APIs. We, we have a little head start, still have a few things to do. So I apologize for um, not showing you a very nice uh, dashboard here. Though so the marketing department will probably kill me when they see the movie after this. But I I'm, I'm really just wanted to show you and prove a point. So I am now a, let's say I'm a Piper. This is one of the projects that I'm, I've got access to. So I click on this link. And what is happening now is obviously that the, the whole package that needs to come across to the AppStream instance is, was, was created when I clicked on that. It was passed through a, a set of, of, um, of Lambda functions that is then passed to what we now are building, which we call a fleet manager. So when we create this platform, it will be basically be, be um, something that our developers can use out of the box, not having to know too much about um, uh, AppStream itself. And we will be managing that on, on a platform level. So we've started the application. I'll go full screen. Um, and I will, just, I will just pull in some data. And, and again, as, as I said, I'm, I'm not really a, a, a person who knows how to create ships or, or tension lake platforms or uh, process plants and whatever. So, um, so excuse me for, for if, if there is someone who really understands to do these designs, I, I, I apologize in advance. Anyway, the, the thing that I really want to show you is that this is just a very small piece of, um, of a construction. But the cool thing, the one that I just, I, I just love is the fact, when I'm running this now, so I'm running this out of a region here in the States, the graphics performance that I get, so I'm running this right now on a Windows 10 tablet. I've got the application installed locally as well. You know, I, I travel a lot and I have to show people what we're doing. But I can assure you that the performance that I get running this in the cloud is much, much better than what I get out of my own tablet, which I think is pretty amazing. And, and so the interaction is great. Uh, I will do something which is probably quite stupid, again, because I don't really have no, no but You see, just to show you that it's, it's fully live, it's very responsive. Uh, one question that we, we uh, ask ourselves and that we also ask customers that we will very soon be engaging with in, in proof of concepts and beyond that is, is this a tool where you could have a designer work eight to 10 hours a day? Because if that answer isn't yes, then we're in trouble and we have to improve. Now, although I said I'm not a designer, for me, looking at this tool, uh, working with it and feeling how it works, 
There is no doubt that this is definitely a tool that I would be able to work with eight hours a day. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, as you can see, this was running in a conference center with no firewall changes, no network port changes, all running on a Chrome browser uh, and delivering you at a really high fidelity experience. Uh, so this was uh, the Aviva demo. Today we are launching what's called a Try It Now. We are working. We have worked with a set of ISVs and partners. Uh, and by the end of the day today, if you go to aws.amazon.com/appstream2, you can log in with your AWS credentials and actually try the whole end user experience by yourself. Uh, you will be able to test drive a set of productivity applications as well as a set of graphical applications. Uh, each of the uh, right now sessions are for 30 minutes. So you can upload your data, give it a ticket for a spin, uh, and then give it, give it a try uh, and experience uh, the streaming uh, platform and the streaming technology without having to do any setup. Uh, the last thing is uh, what other things can we do uh, working with you? Uh, if you're an ISV uh, who builds software uh, that enterprises consume, uh, we want to work with you to build a licensed mobility program so that you can actually, so our customers can run the workloads on AWS. Uh, we're also opening up a certification uh, opportunity with our ISPs where we want to certify your, your application running on AWS, uh, uh, whether it is on a compute instance, whether it's on a graphical instance, or using with Elastic GPU, so we want to work with you. And then we want to enable our customers to start using trials, use this as a training platform, and use this as a software as service delivery vehicle. So, so we, 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 will, uh, have, we have details of all this on the Amazon, Amazon AppStream 2.0 portal uh, that will be going live today. And you can go check out that information. Uh, what's coming next? Uh, we just started the journey. We went back to the drawing board. We have uh, launched a new platform today. Uh, but we want to make sure that this platform is, continues to be extensible for all the three verticals. Uh, so some of the very new features that will come in, a, in the next quarter, uh, SAML integration. Uh, this will allow you to federate your enterprise users uh, and authenticate using your existing Active Directories. We'll provide lifecycle hooks. This is for when an instance comes up or a streaming session starts up. As Matt said, you want actually the data to be passed into the instance as well as to the application. That's the only time when that application is going to be super useful. Uh, we do have APIs, but there are extensions that we are building that will give you the flexibility. For example, if you want to activate a licensing software at, when the application starts, or you want to check out a license at the beginning of the application, that will give you the ability to do that. Uh, Built-in storage, uh, we are providing what's currently a session storage. So it's the, you can use the data during the course of the session. But if you want the session, to be, but if you want the data to persist across sessions, uh, then you can use the built-in storage. Uh, the the next one is stopped instance capacity. Uh, we kind of talked about how the current scaling uh, algorithms that we have will provide you the instant-on experience. This is super critical for the workload that we saw just now, where you log into a browser, you log in to a portal or a dashboard, and you want to use the application. But in the high-performance computing space, you typically do this using bad jobs, where unless the previous step of the bad job has not finished, you don't really need an instance uh, to be there. In those cases, what, to provide much more cost-effective offering, we're going to provide you a stopped instance. So you can create a fleet, but all of them are stopped. Just before you need it, you tell us through an API call, get the instance ready for us in the next X minutes, and that instance will be ready with the reservation guarantee. Uh, so that will be available. And some of our enterprise customers really want domain join instances. Uh, this is primarily to access their corporate resources, as well as some of the database servers and filers that they use. And to support that, we'll be enabling this. Uh, so that's some of the upcoming features. Uh, but this is not the complete set. But these are some of the key things that we are working on. Uh, and this will be available in Q1. Thank you uh, for taking time. We have two other presentations today, uh, the CMP320. Uh, this is where we will be talking about how you use uh, Elastic GPUs with uh, AppStream 2.0. Uh, so we have a customer of ours who will be talking and sharing their uh, workload and case study. Uh, the second one is the BAP204. Uh, this is where uh, we have a customer of ours uh, uh, who has been along with this journey uh, all along, has actually uh, uh, been working on the Amazon AppStream 2.0 platform 
and they're going to be sharing their roadmap and strategy as to why uh, being a leading CAD CAM provider, uh, they still believe streaming is the right platform and how they're actually embarking on this journey. Uh, so those are the two sessions uh, that are some, somewhat related to this track. So thank you for your time. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And of course,